beyond the treatment given the social stigma and a different reality that exists for the community. If you can just uh, share about that. Uh, thanks. Uh, actually, uh, trans, uh, when we deal with the transgender community is very sensitive. We don't know much about them. In the family, we have male, female, but we hardly have TZ in every household, so we fail to understand them. But the discrimination is so high that when we talk to them, we feel that they are, uh, as I has said, the, the, the discrimination itself started in, from the family. So, like uh, earlier, uh, more, I, I said uh, there are sub uh, substantial number of drug addicts. When they uh, want to go for treatment, uh, uh, since uh, most of them, are the higher group is the trans women who are biologically male. So we used to send them to uh, the, the addiction center of uh, male where they find very, very, you know, like uh, bullying type kind of thing, discrimination. So they don't want to stay uh, to get treatment, so they uh, failed to come out uh, for treatment till now. So to talk about what is happening, because if they talk about the problem, they'll have to mention that they are not in a non-marital relationship, which itself has so much of stigma attached to it. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Just one more follow up question, uh, a very quick one. Uh, so uh, we were just discussing about how, you know, you mentioned about power and patriarchy working together and how that uh, often stimulates violence against women. But what we were also wondering is whether when women are themselves uh, dependent on drugs, um, depending on where they are in the power hierarchy within their families or in the social context that they are living in, um, is there also violence that they are perpetrating on probably their children or anybody else who's at a relatively varying power uh, position than them. Do you have any examples of that or yeah, so, any insights? Yeah, so we've been doing, you know, looking at this whole issue of female to male violence, female to child violence. So um, the rates of female to male violence are really very low. It's not that it doesn't happen, it happens. And particularly in the context of substance, substance use, it does happen. But if you look at the rates, they are like totally different, you know, very few. Many women are violence towards men because of the violence they face in some way or the other, or because of the victimization they are facing. Either it's a protest or it's, but then it's kind of highlighted much more. So uh, I think we need to remember that. But violence towards um, elder people in the family or violence towards children uh, is something which is definitely an issue. Uh, this is uh, not just with substance use, but even with women with mental health problems, because they are they have no way, other way of expressing their mental health issues. And particularly with substance use, there is violence towards uh, these two groups. Either the elder, there's elder abuse if there is there are elders in the family or child abuse. And again, that child that leads to transgenerational violence. Because then the child is subjected to violence, the child, they, they grow up, they feel that the only way to cope with issues is violence. And that's how the violence perpetuates. So again, uh, you know, very important to intervene early, uh, particularly women. So it's not that women are not violent, but um, it, it occurs in different ways. And it's, uh, and the, the rate, the severity of violence does not seem to be as high as male to female violence. You know, if you look at the recent report from the UN Women on femicides, you know, and the number of uh, homicides that are happening towards women, it's way, way, way much more than ever. So ever the woman committing uh, murders or homicides. So the, if you look at the, you know, kind of violence, the range of violence, it's, it's very high the other way around. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. I think that is very insightful and for us to look at it from the whole uh, dimension that you draw, draw of power because uh, we often look at things in a very black and white manner, but that changes with uh, different situations. So thank you uh, very, very much, Dr. Chandra. I know you have to leave. Uh, so uh, Thank you very and... much for having me. I really enjoyed <laughs> listening to everyone. And can we start Kalaripa at 60 also? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, definitely. Okay, great. See you. Bye.
Thank you so much, Dr. Chanda, for joining in. So we will quickly have a one one question for both the panelists. I know we're running short of time in case either of the two of you have to leave. Please let us know. Um, so uh, to uh, Mujib, uh, we have a question like, so disciplining is something that when we even look at our drug addiction centers, we try to, you know, uh, in, uh, try to make the dependence in buying, like basic things like cleaning their uh, space or waking up on time. Uh, and things like that. So, of course, Calorie Pio 2 and the way that you have described it requires a lot of discipline and practice. So, uh, we were just wondering if um, there are any examples of drug dependents who've managed to imbibe Calorie Pio 2 as a practice and, uh, you know, go through the process of healing or people who about it has kind of uh, prevented their temptation towards going into drug use in the first place. So, if you could share some insights. Okay, I, actually, uh, that is... Uh, Two types. Uh, we can um, we can uh, practice uh, drug addiction. Hello. You're audible. Okay. Uh, so in uh, two time we can do that. Uh, we can give training to drug drug addict, and uh, we can slowly uh, increase uh, his mental strength. And he can uh, by practicing calorie pay too. We can reduce his uh, stress depression and and to and. Any doubts you can ask me. Uh, yes, Mr. Mujib, the queries and doubts will actually do in the end uh, when all the panelists are in. And thank you so much. It was very insightful. Uh -huh. And I'm personally very interested in learning Calorie Pair 2 now. And uh -huh. I hope I will find something in Delhi for that. Uh, th that's what I think. Uh, you can, uh, anybody can start Calorie Pair 2 at any age. You can uh, not only clarify to you are to uh, what we believe is everybody should uh, practice any kind of martial art that is available near to them. So uh, clarify to is the our own martial art, Indian own martial art. So we are giving importance to clarify to. But if there is no clarify to center and we have a, a other martial art center, you can go and learn that. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Muji. Thank you. And. Now I would like to request uh, I would like to call upon Miss K Saroja, third panelist. Miss K Saroja is the deputy director, social welfare department of Manipur. A postgraduate in sociology, she has been working with the department for the last 23 years in different capacities on various issues related with children, elderly, and drugs. Uh, I request Ma'am to come forward and share her in experience of implementing an MBA in Manipur. Good afternoon, everyone, and I thank uh, you all for uh, inviting me for this uh, panel discussion. And as we all know that uh, drug and substance use is a so serious problem which affect the public health, socioeconomic condition of the individual, uh, family, and society as a whole. It is viewed as a psychosocial medical problem. It has become a serious concern of the country. Uh, what is more alarming is that uh, there are many reports on the increase in the number of psychoactive substance users among the uh, young age group of children as early as 12 years of age and the women whom we consider the uh, assets of the nation. So we need to curve the menace at the earliest possible at the maximum level. And Nasamu Bharat Abhiyan is a very strong, strong initiative taken up by the ministry to combat the menace of drug addiction in the country. The government of India under the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment launched Nasamu Bharat Abhiyan on 15 August 2022 in uh, 272 districts, which include nine districts of Manipur, identified by the Narcotics Control Bureau as the most vulnerable in terms of the uses of drugs in the country. Now, one district has also been included recently. So we have 10 uh, districts for the state of Manipur. Uh, let me highlight the scenario of the state of Manipur. Uh, the geographical location of the state of Manipur, which shares a porous international uh, border of 398 uh, kilometer approximately make the state highly vulnerable to the problem of drug use and its related issues. Manipur is one of the states in India with high evidence of 
uh, incidence of people affected by psychoactive use in Manipur is an alarming rate. Uh, prevalence of almost all category of substance use in Manipur is high. Uh, is is shown in the as evidence as reported in the status of the magnitude of substance use in India 2019, conducted by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. Uh, in Manipur, poppy poppy plantation is uh, rampant. Easily availability of this illegal psychoactive substance uh, use is one of the major factor for consumption of these uh, psychoactive substances in the state. Earlier, it was only the uh, we are consuming uh, state since it's in a transit route, and now we are again a producing state. There are incidents of uh, busting small factories, uh, then laboratories by the police, by the state police. Uh, hence, I would like to share a few uh, initiatives that has been taken up by the department uh, uh, to address the issue of the psychoactive substance. Uh, earlier, uh, before we uh, start up with the uh, Nasamu Bharat or the National Action Plan for Drug Demand Reduction, we uh, the state government had already launched uh, a scheme entitled Nisa Laitaba Manipur Semlesi, which means let's make Manipur drug free on uh, 26 June of 2018. But, uh, later, it was merged again with the National Action Plan for Drug Demand Reduction, since most of the components are similar with the scheme. And uh, as of now, we have uh, 27. Uh, uh, IRCA under the ministry out of this, uh, one is for the children who are under 18 and the, uh, we are also focused on uh, the women. We have three at the uh, IRCA uh, for women and uh, and we have also won the addiction center run by the state government. Uh, we we was uh, opened recently on 26 June of 2022. And uh, now after this, we have also uh, frame, uh, uh, the frame the Manipur State Policy on Psychoactive Substances 2019 uh, for strengthening the state government endeavor of making Manipur free from illegal use of all psychoactive substances using three pronged strategy of demand reduction, supply reduction, and harm reduction, which are implemented under the states uh, as control society under the uh, uh, health department. Nasamu Bharat Abhiyan. Now we have this program also, and uh, under this now uh, uh, it is being as I have said, is being implemented in the ten district of Manipur uh, prevention. Uh, has proven to be the most effective strategy to counter this problem. Most of the program under the NASA Bharat Abhiyan are focused more on primary prevention with intent to raise awareness among the masses on drug abuse with the target uh, groups on the higher educational institutions and targeting counseling sessions, treatment facility available for addicts on psychoactive substances capacity building programs, et cetera, which are all there in the uh, uh, Nasamuk and uh, under the uh, uh, state action plan for drug demand reduction. Since Nasamuk was launched during the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, we focus, uh, earlier we focus on conducting various programs online like slogan uh, competition, short, making short films, painting essay competition for students and masses. And uh, we upload it on the YouTube for uh, awareness generation. Now we focus on prices. We focus on primary prevention. Uh, we go, uh, we gradually started organizing various uh, sensitization and training programs for student teachers uh, and, and the uh, uh, community uh, leaders. And uh, we are also planning to provide training exclusively for teachers offline and online, uh, since we uh, view that. In, uh, Teachers plays a very important role since most of these our uh, children uh, spend their time in schools, and they are the teachers. They are uh, uh, who can uh, uh, 
the act as a counselor for them. So we organize uh, training, uh, five days TOT training for the student and teachers uh, so, uh, by selecting few schools from every district. And uh, what the objectives of the program was to uh, sensitize them and make the school uh, uh, to declare the school as drug free school and they will be act as a counselor as we have in Abhasyatna. And uh, we have other different programs also, uh, like uh, we organize uh, musical concert. Uh, uh, we did uh, with lectures and questions round, incorporating all those things. Listening to music allows the message that are conveyed in the lyrics and plays a motivational tool to increase youth participation in the campaign. Uh, and various programs are also organized at the uh, uh, district level. And for that, uh, for which Thaubal uh, got, Thaubal district got second position in the best performing district under Nassam Mubarak Avian. I would like to mention here that we, uh, uh, we are, uh, I would like to uh, put in uh, some uh, challenges here. Uh, where we have not uh, paid much, much attention uh, as uh, that uh, doctors and uh, Prabhat Sandra has mentioned women are also now affected by uh, drugs and uh, women who are on drugs and addiction are often associated with uh, sex works for their livelihood and survival. Uh, most of them uh, are disowned by the family members. This is the greatest uh, discrimination. Uh, we, as I have said, we have three uh, uh, treatment center for them, uh, 15 bed at each. It is a challenge for us to reintegrate them uh, to the society after the treatment is completed since family acceptance is very low. So we have to design a uh, rehabilitation program by focusing more on skill development for income generation and uh, for sustainable livelihood where they can stay a place uh, at a place where they can stay with their children. So, guys, okay. Uh, so that uh, sorry for um. And uh, I would like to mention again one more community which have, we have been neglecting so far that we have uh, uh, they are very vulnerable and marginalized community uh, uh it is the tz community transgender community they face discrimination and gender based violence we start from their family itself as a result they are uh, more prone to depression and mental uh, mental disorder for the uh, this make them more vulnerable to uh, uh, take drugs and, and uh, psychoactive substances. Uh, if I say from the Manipur perspective, we have a TZ wellness center supported by uh, NACO and the uh, ITAC India, where uh, at, Jaha, at, at, at the medical institutions, it was launched on 25th March 2021. This is the first transgender health clinic in India. And uh, it, it, we have two units, a help desk and a wellness center that provide holistic health care to the transgender community. There we find substantial number of TZ who are on active, on addiction of psychoactive substance use who need treatment. We are, uh, with this view, we are uh, all set to set up uh, transgender the addiction center, one for trans men and one for trans uh, women. Uh, and it is worth to mention here that we have uh, many privately uh, run the addiction center in Manipur. Uh, now the state government has formulated and notified in official gazette the guideline for regulation of this uh, private de addiction center uh, for having a standardized treatment protocol and minimum standard of care and services for treatment and rehabilitation of users for common uh, social transmission, we call it trust centers. 
sustainable living as a part of treatment. No doubt we have incorporated yoga, kitchen gardening, and other recreational activities as a part of treatment in the addiction center with in the existing rehabilitation center that is Erika under the ministry. However, we need to provide skill development, a vocational training as a part of treatment for sustainable livelihood. We lack these facilities in all this Erika. We have a government, uh, as I said, we have a government run the addiction center uh, with 50 bedded capacity. It was lost on 26 June this year. Uh, we have there we have started imparting one month training on wall painting supported by an agency so i think for uh, giving them uh, this uh, sustainable livelihood we need to have a convergence work with all the life department it is not that we only uh, uh, do it from a one uh, or department cannot do all these things so we need a convergence with all the line department to have a drug free uh, India. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much, Saroja Ji and the other two panelists. I think uh, time is very less for us to discuss, and we have a panelist coming from very diverse backgrounds who have experience in very different uh, spaces geographically and otherwise. So um, I will quickly uh, go over some of the questions that uh, have come up through our FP Live and also among us who've been listening to um, all of you. So first I would like to ask uh, Dr. Chandra, you know, you've uh, talked about uh, women uh, in mostly in terms of familial relations, like who are in family and setups. But what I'm really curious about is to kind of understand uh, how does gender-based violence and drug use among women happen who are uh, basically destitute or who do not have a, a typical family household setup that we usually talk of women um, you know, in the space of. So could you uh, please uh, let us know a little about that? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, you know, um... Uh, Gender-based violence uh, occurs quite a bit in public spaces uh, also um, in the context of substance use, both uh, both if the perpetrator uh, is under the uh, influence of substances or if the woman herself is under the influence of substances. So either ways, I think, um, you know, sexual assault has been uh, linked quite a bit to uh, substance use in even in public spaces. We also know that in public spaces where, let's say, um, women in um, you know uh, in sex work, like uh, Saroja ji mentioned, I think that's another very vulnerable group uh, where uh, a lot of victimization uh, occurs. We must also remember that many women take substances in the in to to um, cope with the victimization that they have faced. So it can be a consequence, it can be a cause, it, it can be both. Um, the, um, the other group is, again, the marginalized groups. Among those are the LGBTQI plus, um, you know, group which also struggles with uh, this issue. Uh, and again, because they don't have uh, safe spaces to talk about some of them, their unique problems, uh, this gets uh, hidden. So I think uh, these are some of the places where you might uh, find uh, substance use uh, having a very strong role in gender-based violence. Even among adolescents, we are finding that, like, for example, dating violence uh, often happens in the con context of substance use. So these are all non-familial spaces. Uh, women who are homeless, uh, particularly women with mental illness who are homeless, uh, and are using substances, again, uh, victimization happens. So I think, you know, the canvas is very large. And maybe the first step would be to even at least document and look at the canvas of, you know, what would the spread of substance use among women, how it affects women, how uh, women who are using substances um, get victimized. I think these are important things. Another important thing I want to mention is that there's a lot of repeat victimization which happens among women who use substances. Like I mentioned, uh, many of the women who use substances, a large percent, a very large percentage, percentage have had child maltreatment themselves, child sexual abuse, adverse childhood experiences. So they have already been victimized and hence there is this inability to um, 
you know protest inability because there has been a situation of helplessness as they are growing up so uh, that is another thing which adds to the victimization 41 youth clubs and committees have been formed 4000 activities have been taken up by yuva mandal <laughs> And 300 plus social media interns have reached out to more than 17 lakh people. And peer programs have been connected, uh, conducted with uh, uh, youth uh, between 10 to 17 years of age. Uh, programs have been uh, conducted in education institute, institutions as well. 56,453 education institutions have been covered under NMPA. Several activities and competi competitions on the themes of substance abuse have, been, have taken place. Natamuk or drug free clubs have been formed, drug free educational institutions have been declared, and development of Navjetna modules uh, for uh, drug education in the schools have also started. So, uh, under NMBA, several university collaborations have taken place with, uh, with many uh, universities like Christ University, Vellore Institute of Technology, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Pondicherry University, and Bhopal School of Social Sciences. Next slide, please. Okay, so NMBA has realized that uh, special uh, attention should uh, be paid to the border villages. And there has been planned to conduct se several uh, special awareness programs and workshops in the border villages. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a glimpse of the community programs that uh, is that has taken place in the several states of the country, which uh, constitutes citywide campaigns on substance use, awareness, Ratvans, Yatras for mass awareness in the districts, Nukta Nataks in public, uh, and in public and community areas, community rallies, vigils, sabha and sessions, wall paintings, codings, um, and messages against substance use. Next slide, please. Uh, social media has also been channelized uh, for uh, putting this message against uh, substance use forward. So, 63,000, more than 63,000 posts have been shared by college students through their social media handles, and more than 17.5 lakh people have been reached out through the post of these students, students on NMB and substance use. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the uh, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment also celebrated Naya Bharat, Nashamak Bharat in the month of June with a culmination on 26 June to mark the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have the NMBA website, uh, which is a, uh, which has National De-Addiction Helpline and Dashboard, Expert Forum and dis Discussion Page, NMBA Dashboard with Real-Time Data and Figures, Pledge for citizens and recovered substance users and citizens corner with feedback and grievance and citizen starter. Next slide. Along with these activities, uh, panel discussion with DCs and DMs of these uh, states implementing an MBA has also been organized. We also have a monthly e-newsletter with activities and updates and activities, uh, initiatives that has been taken by the states for the Abhiyan. Uh, we also have... Uh, Train, training for Augmenting Productivity and Services, which is an online learning management program. It is conducting an online training on substance abuse. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> along with this, we have Mission of Tetna, which sensitizes students who are, of, who are between 11 to 16 years of age, their teachers and parents on drug dependence, uh, uh, related coping strategies and life skills. For this, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment has collaborated with Ministry of Education uh, and, uh, and will train teachers across the country at district level to National Council for Education, Research and training. Next slide. Okay. So if we see the bigger picture, uh, NMB, under NMBA, 3.1 crore people have been covered. 55,461 education institutions have been covered. 32, uh, more than 32 lakh women have been reached out, 1.59 crore uh, youth have been reached out, and 56,780 activities have been conducted. So after the successful implementation of NMBA, Nashamak Bharat Abhiyan 2.2 was launched, which added 100 more districts to the existing uh, 272. 
uh, for the for this, uh, the launch program was attended by the APC cadets in the presence of Honorable Minister of Defense. Next slide. Uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariva, for sharing about Nashamuk Bharat Abhiyan. Now I would like to call upon uh, Ritika to give a short presentation on the Nai Chetna campaign. Thank you, Rohan. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Today I, Ritika Madan, am I audible? Okay. Today I, Ritika Madan, State Coordinator of Program Monitoring Unit, would be presenting about Nai Chetna, a national vendor campaign and an initiative of Ministry of Rural Development. As we all know, a primary issue impacting the lives of women and persons of marginalized communities is gender-based violence. From intimate partner violence to violence in public spaces, gender becomes a key factor in deciding how people are treated. It is therefore critical to ensure continuous work to combat the issue of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is a global pandemic that affects one in three women in their lifetime. The NCRB data for 2021 suggests that there is a significant rise of 15.3% of crime against women from 56.5% in 2020 to 64.5% in 2021. According to the 2021 annual report, NCRB, 31,677 rape cases were registered across the country, an average of 86 cases daily. Arise from 2020 with 28,046 cases, while in 2019, 32,000 cases were registered. According to NSFS, as many as 77% of women never sought help from anyone about the violence inflicted on them. Many reasons were cited for this. Some of them are women are unable to identify violence meted out to them because of the normalization of violence and discrimination. Even if they do identify violence, they are unable to share or raise their voice against the gender-based discrimination to avoid shaming and naming. Women rarely seek support and continue to suffer in silence. Even if women want to seek support, they are largely unaware of the redressal mechanism and service providers and they lack legal awareness. Lack of perceived space for sharing and registering violence is one of the reasons for this. Hence, Deen Dayal Antyodhya Yojana, National Rural Livelihood Mission, under the Ministry of Rural Development, through its gender interventions, has been making strategic efforts in addressing issues of gender equality. Hence, a long and the month long campaign has been designed to create a concerted effort in acknowledging, identifying, and addressing issues of violence. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I'll be talking about the brief of the campaign. This is an annual campaign, uh, the theme of which is gender-based violence. Each year, there will be a specific theme which will be identified. The campaign will be implemented by all states in collaboration with CSO partners and actively executed by all levels, including the state, district, and block, engaging the community institutions along with extended communities. The campaign will also bring together online online departments and com uh, communities, stakeholders to create a concert, concerted efforts in acknowledging, identifying, and addressing the issues of violence. Next slide. The goal of the campaign is to advance the agency and rights of women and gender diverse individuals by addressing structural barriers for a dignified living with no fear and discrimination and violence based on their gender and intersectional identity. Next slide. Uh, the various stakeholders for this would be nine ministries and departments. For example, uh, Department of Women and Child Development, uh, Health Ministry, Home Affairs, Tribal Affairs, Social Justice and Empowerment, and so on. Members of the community, Panchayati Raj and urban local bodies, and uh, community social service organizations, such as Pradhan, uh, UNICEF, and all. Next slide. Now, uh, I'll uh, talk about the linkage between the gender-based violence and drug abuse, uh, because today's topic is all about that. 87% of addicts being treated in a de-addiction center run by a police in Delhi reported having been violent with 
family members. As we all know, drug abuse is one of the biggest challenge faced by the country. Therefore, it is critical for us to look at it through an intersectional lens, both in terms of impact and cure. As we all know, gender-based violence is closely linked to drug abuse, where women and persons from uh, marginalized sections are often prone to violence from drug, drug dependence, along with their being uh, more vulnerable to addiction due to rampant social, societal discrimination. Through this panel discussion, our panelists would be unwrapping the link between the gender-based violence and drug abuse. Over to you, Somya. Thank you so much, Ritika, for sharing about uh, the details about Nai Chetna. Now, I would like to call upon Rehan to give a presentation on Mission Life. Am I audible? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rehan, and I will be giving a very brief uh, presentation on Mission Life, which is an acronym for Lifestyle for Environment. The idea of which was uh, propounded by the Honorable Prime Minister COP26 in Glasgow. So uh, the basic premise behind uh, Mission Life is that a significant share of the global carbon emissions comes from the simple choices that uh, we citizens make in our personal lives. Uh, for example, according to the United Nations, <clears throat> it's very interesting to note that if only 1 billion people of out of the 8 billion of us decided to make sustainable life choices, the total global carbon, carbon emissions could be reduced by over 20%. And it is because of this view that mission life has been envisaged. So let's just go over mission life in brief. Uh, the objectives of Mission Life is basically to encourage individuals to uh, adopt environmentally conscious lifestyle choices that focus on uh, mindful and deliberate utilization instead of mindless and wasteful consumption. And uh, for, in order to achieve this objective, uh, the ministry has envisaged has uh, three core shifts uh, through which this objective is going to be accomplished. The first is changing demand, which is which has basically got to do with uh, influencing consumer behavior towards adopting more uh, sustainable life choices, sustainable uh, consumer choices. Uh, the second tenet is changing the supply side side of things in order to facilitate the uh, adjustment with the changing demand. And the third is changing policy, which is basically adjusting policy decisions uh, in order to facilitate the previous two steps. And so keeping in keeping in mind the above, uh, Mission Life envisages a comprehensive but non-exhaustive list of about 75 life actions for individuals, communities, and institutions, which have been grouped under seven broad categories. And we shall be going over them uh, in, the, in the subsequent slides. So the first category is saving, saving upon energy. We use a lot of energy uh, and there are, there, there are some simple steps we could, we as individuals could do that in order to reduce this energy usage, such as, such as uh, using public transport wherever possible, using bicycles for local or short commutes, uh, using biogas for cooking, cooking and electricity needs, among other things. We could also be, we could also increase our dependence on solar energy. Uh, the next step is uh, saving water as much as possible, using efficient water saving technology, such as rainwater harvesting and uh, et cetera. The next is reducing the amount of single use plastic we use, which is a big uh, contributor to the global carbon emission. Uh, the next is reducing the amount of e-waste we produce. We all of us use smartphones and laptops these days and sooner or later, these are going to be obsolete and we're going to have to discard them. So it's our responsibility to sort of uh, figure out how to discharge them without polluting the environment anymore. The next is uh, developing and adopting sustainable food systems. Uh, we could uh, prefer locally available seasonal foods. Uh, we could also uh, choose to uh, make better use of food waste, such as composting them. Uh, the next is reducing the amount of water we waste, the, the amount of waste we uh, contribute. 
and the next is uh, adopting healthy lifestyles for example planting medicinal plants uh, planting trees everywhere we can so uh, that was all from me thank you so much thank you so much rehan for the insightful presentation and now uh, moving forward we would like to begin our panel discussion so now it's time to call upon our extreme panelist our first panelist is dr prabha s chandra dr prabha s chandra is a senior professor of psychiatry and dean of faculty behavioral sciences at nimhans bangalore her work focuses on the mental health of women in vulnerable sections including women facing gender based violence women in perinatal period and women with mental illnesses she is the president of the international association of women's mental health and leads the sri manoraksha project funded by the ministry of women and child development which trains staff and counselors in 704 one stop centers across india on responding to mental health issues related to gender based violence dr prabha is also an active researcher with 320 publications in several books and research grants related to women's mental health we welcome you ma'am uh thank you very much uh, shreya somya and all the people who spoke before me uh, it was really wonderful to listen to all the good work that is being done and i think it's very important to have a collaborative and interdisciplinary approach when we are dealing with such a complex uh, situation such as uh, substance use uh, and women and its interface with gender based violence so in the next 10 minutes or so um, what i'm going to do is take you through three big uh, points one is um, you know a little bit about female uh, substance use in our country uh, and uh, what are the kind of substances available what are the and then i'll talk a little bit on the factors which lead to substance use in women uh, then we'll talk a little bit about impact of substance use uh, on women's health both mental and physical and i will finally end with the uh, very important topic Uh, about the relationship between gender based violence and drug use both in self and in the partner or in the family so let's first talk about uh, substance use in women now for a long long time the focus of substance use work or research or surveys was mainly in men and it was kind of assumed that you know women don't have so much of substance use uh, in fact the earlier surveys uh, which had been there was a big study which was called the genesis study which was done in india and that uh, looked at the rates of um, alcohol use it really didn't even talk about other substances uh, and found that the rate of alcohol use was uh, let's say in the past one year alcohol use was 36.5% in men at least once and you know only 5% in women so it was always thought of that you know women substance use is not such a big problem but like it has been discussed earlier uh the recent review um, surveys so there has not been a very large scale survey yet uh on substance use in women which is really something that needs to be done um and i'll talk about the problems which may be there when you do such a survey but having said that um many studies which have been done in de addiction centers in communities have found that substance use is increasing in women alcohol is of course still on top it's probably the most important uh substance which is being used uh probably because of its easy availability um you know women can have access to it very easily uh, husbands are drinking so you know there is a sort of sharing of alcohol so many of that those reasons why alcohol is still prominent but uh, other drugs are increasingly being com- consumed some of the top drugs which are consumed are cannabis uh, which is uh, particularly in young people which has become quite popular Uh, and you know in many countries cannabis has been legalized i've just gone to uh, netherlands and come back and you could get uh, cannabis in the street uh, so easily in the form of uh, you know lollipops in the form of sweets in the form of cookies brownies any form so uh, considering that cannabis use is so normalized uh, in many countries and uh, after all our youth also have access to social media to information Uh, so the feeling that you know cannabis is something which is so it's like a party drug it's you know it's something normal people can use it uh, as a result what has happened is in the last uh, few years the use of cannabis has increased uh, phenomenally uh, in um, in women and particularly in young women um, 
The second drug which is uh, again being used is, and that's not in young people, it's overall in other countries as well and in India, uh, what we call narcotic analgesics and non-prescription analgesics. So a lot of women actually uh, consume uh, painkillers, uh, paracetamol, other kind of analgesics quite often and sleeping pills quite often because there is always a friendly pharmacist who will give them medication without a prescription. Now, why this happens, this is many women uh, have uh, rates of depression and anxiety are much higher among women compared to men. Many women do not recognize that they have anxiety or depression, which often manifests as uh, sleeplessness, as difficulty concentrating, and so the tendency to go and start, uh, you know, sleeping pills. And then when they start these minor tranquilizers, drugs like Restil, Alprax are so easily available and that becomes like a habit. So non-prescription drug use. So initially, maybe they'll get a prescription from a doctor, but the same prescription will be used for two years and every day the person is taking. And we know that these drugs also gradually cause dependence and, the, and you know, increase in dosages. So the patterns of substance use are slightly different in women compared to men. Uh, and I think it's very important for us when we we think of, you know, other forms of drugs like stimulants and heroin and cocaine. While all of the cocaine heroin stream is still there in women, much less, probably in some parts of the country, like the Northeast, where generally certain drugs are highly available, it is more. But certain other kinds of substances like cannabis, non-prescription drug use are also very important and we should be completely aware of it. Women may also be taking multiple drugs. So that is another important thing. Now, let us look at the factors that contribute to drug use in women. It's very interesting to see that quite often a drug using woman will have a family member or a partner who's using substances. So a lot of the initiation of drug use happens uh, through this. You know, you're in a close relationship, a very dependent relationship, partners using substances, or there is a father in the family who's using substances. And that kind of normalizes substance use for the woman and uh, there is substance use. So there's, there seems to be a, a relationship with the person, the, the company you keep. The second issue is there seems to be a strong genetic loading in women. So if there is a parent who's had a drug use problem uh, or there's a brother who's had a drug use problem, the chances of drug use in women becomes higher because we all know that for all kinds of substance use, there is a genetic vulnerability to substance use. The third is that many women have, like I mentioned earlier, high rates of anxiety, depression, and psychiatric comorbidities, which are untapped, unrecognized, untreated. And uh, we find that women with substance use have much higher rates of psychological problems and comorbidities compared to men. So they probably, uh, you know, use it like self-medication initially, uh, and to, to feel better and then that becomes we know that you know that then becomes increasingly higher and and then they tend to keep a they are very secretive about it they don't talk about it and that kind of escalates the whole thing there is a concept called telescoping in addiction which basically means that from the time you start the drug to the time you become addicted or dependent that is you can't do without it that is much shorter in women compared to men so let's say for alcohol, you start the a boy starts drinking alcohol, increases, increases, may take about 15 years for the person to actually become dependent. Whereas a woman may become dependent in three to four years. So telescoping is much higher in women. So as a result, I think we need to really pay attention more to women's substance use. The final thing I want to uh, emphasize is the, is the impact. Now the impact both on mental and physical health is much higher in women compared to men. Women get intoxicated with lower doses of most drugs, including alcohol and other substances. Uh, and so the risk for, you know, being victimized is more because if a woman is drinking this much or taking very less uh, substance also, her ability to handle that substance may be low. And you then you are prone to victimization. You are prone to violence. You're prone to sexual assault. So that is another problem which is there. Physical health problems are also much higher in women uh, compared to men, including impact on reproduction, impact on the liver, impact on the brain. All of this have been found to be gender related. So for all these reasons, 
uh, it's it, very important for us to pay emphasis and it's a really good program that we have that in the Nasha Mukbharat, we actually including a separate section on women and also tying it in with the gender-based violence issue, right? So I've talked about, you know, the first, the, the levels of substance use, which we really don't know. And I think it's very important for us to know this and, and a nationwide survey needs to happen in different groups of women. Uh, the other group I want to emphasize is the women, is pregnant women. Now we know the impact of substances on the pregnancy outcome as well as on the babies. Uh, and again, obstetricians are not very well trained in detecting substance use. They don't even ask for substance use. They don't ask for substance use in husbands. They don't ask for substance use in women also. Because it is kind of assumed that women may not be taking substances. But we know that the risk of uh, impact of that substance, whether it's alcohol, cannabis, amphetamines, any of that. In fact, even a single drink is not allowed in pregnancy. Even a small amount of alcohol or cannabis is harmful. Um, and if you look at, um, you know, clinics in America or the UK, they, they have guidelines and they screen for substance use. Now, that is something that we are routinely not doing or even for smoking, even for nicotine, we are not doing. Uh, so we are missing a very good opportunity. When we're talking about nicotine, we also need to ask about the husband smoking when a woman is pregnant or is, has a small baby. We are missing that big chunk out, which also has an impact on the baby's health, on the mother's health. So you can imagine when you're talking about gender, there are so many facets to gender in substance use. I probably have about five minutes left, so I'm going to talk finally about the role of gender-based violence and its, and its relationship to substance use, which has come to a big light in the recent you know, last few weeks and months where, you know, so much is going on. I think one of the things that we must uh, remember is there are several ways in gender based, how gender based violence is related to substance use. One is, like I said, the, the partner and the uh, woman may be very, very closely connected through substance use. So substance use becomes a way of communicating with each other. It is quite possible that women are you know, uh, feel that when they take substances, the relationship improves and that becomes a way of nurturing the relationship. And so that is another issue which we must remember when there are couples. The second thing is uh, during intoxication or during withdrawal, both situations can lead to violence. So if the partner is intoxicated, then it may lead to violence. When the partner is going through withdrawal symptoms, it may lead to violence. It may lead to violence both ways because when there are withdrawal symptoms, there is a need to get the drug. And if it is, if that, if there's a pattern that the woman has to go and get some money from somewhere, she's supposed to procure the drug for the uh, the person who's uh, consuming drugs. That can actually lead to violence. The third thing is that drugs like cannabis stimulants can lead to psychosis, hallucinations, suspiciousness, jealousy. Alcohol can lead to a lot of jealousy. All of that can again lead to violence. So it's it's all between the the impact of the drug on the uh, on the relationship. The other important thing which we have seen is that a lot of uh, families uh, and uh, couples, but particularly if there is substance use, they become socially isolated. Now one of the protective factors for against gender based violence is somebody asking. What is going on in your families? You know, finding out who, how the person is. Drug use can relate to a lot of, because there's secretiveness. There are barriers to treatment. There is a stigma. So what happens is that the gradually this family or this uh, couple or this woman gets socially isolated from everybody else. And that can again lead to excessive victimization um, and violence. So I think these are some things that we must remember, impact of the substance itself through intoxication, withdrawal, psychotic behavior like jealousy, hallucinations, social isolation, the need for procuring drugs. And if the woman is not able to procure drugs and the person is intoxicated or withdrawn, they, there can be violence. We must remember also that certain drugs are associated with more violence. So now the literature is saying that alcohol, always known to be associated with violence, especially higher levels of alcohol use, higher levels, more severe violence. So homicides, 
severe injuries can happen when the intoxication levels are higher. That we must remember. Second thing that we must remember is that drugs like cannabis and stimulants are associated with more regender based violence and cocaine. Heroin is a little less. So this is the kind of overall picture I want to give. But I think if we want to prevent something like this, one of the most important risk factors is child maltreatment and early adverse experiences, both in the men and women. One of the ways that we can protect our subsequent generations, of course, availability of drugs is one part which the, you know, with the government is looking at, but from the side of public health or from the people who are working with communities, those children who have a good family environment, where they see that the parents are not fighting, where they see that the father is not violent, that can actually have a protective effect. So we have a good opportunity for prevention. The other thing is that when we talk to women about substance use, let's not be shy of talking to them about substance use. We should say that, look, these are the questions we are asking everybody and we are asking you about substance use. So that is something that I think normalizing it so that the woman also feels comfortable in talking about it. We don't talk about it, so they don't talk about it. So I think opening the conversation around substance use is, is a, another important aspect. So I'm going to end here because I know there are other speakers. So um, that's my speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And it was very insightful to know and drug use and women is something which is not talked about uh, anywhere and more research needs to be done on that and we should really talk more about it and be more aware. So now I would like to call upon uh, our second panelist, which is Mr. Mujib Rahman. Mr. Rahman has been a culinary prior to pra practitioner for 23 years with several other accolades, such as being the All India Fencing Gold Medalist in 2016, culinary prior to and fencing trainer for eight years, uh, practice Marma treatment at culinary, diploma in Ayurveda, Panchkarma treatment, diploma in yoga, cinema stunt choreographer, and the convener of the Kerala Fencing Association. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Mujib to now proceed with his presentation. Okay. Namaskar, everyone. So, they introduced, Tommy introduced me about me very well. So, I don't want to introduce myself. <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel discussion. Okay. So, uh, I'm talking about Kalari Petu. So, let me introduce about Kalari Petu. Uh, Kalari Petu is an ancient Indian martial art from Kerala, uh, uh, especially from uh, southern part of India, not only in Kerala, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Karnataka, everywhere they practice Kalari Petu in different names. In Tamil Nadu, they call us Silampam uh, and Kuttu Arashu, different names, but the same thing. But we call us uh, Kalari Petu is the art from Kerala and believe that the, this is the mother of all martial arts in the world. Uh, if we type in Google, we can see that Kalaripati is the oldest martial art. So, uh, Kalaripati has five different stages of training. Meitari, Koltari, Angatari, Virungai, and Kalari Marma treatment. Okay, Meitari is the first stage which includes animal postures and other different movements which helps to uh, improve body flexibility and balance. That's the initial stage. We start with some exercise kind of things that with postures we can see in yoga that yoga postures like that in Kalari we have we call it uh, Vadivu postures. Okay, then uh, we have plenty of uh, animal postures in Kalari Paitu and we have a movement we call as Tuvadu and the second stage uh, it is called Tari. Kol means six. So we have basically six rotation and six fight. Uh, in second stage, we gave uh, more importance, uh, importance to focus and concentration. And third stage, uh, it is Angatari. Angam means war. So this is basically warfare training, which includes weapon training like knife, sword, shield, urumi, uh, spear, etc., etc., etc. Actually, it needs more strength and uh, stamina. So while practicing Angatari using this weapon, uh, the person, the who person the who practice Kalipetu, he come out from the fear of facing weapons in any situation or any circumstances. Also, he can uh, face any challenges in the life. He can 
face threads everything okay uh, uh, fourth stage is uh, bare hand fight we call this wearing game in this we can uh, uh, the kalari practitioner learn pressure points in uh, kalari teams we called as marma point marma stanangal so we can easily defeat the opponent without using strength we use uh, technique uh, by pointing on marma point so that is the uh, fourth point and fifth fifth stage is kalari marma treatment uh, we know that we have uh, traditional uh, treatment techniques in india kalari marma tre- treatment is the one of the finest old treatment technique so in this uh, we can say kalari marma treatment as the best sport medicine because it treats uh, tennis elbows stone lightis uh, disc uh, issues joint dislocation etc 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 so this is about the uh, just introduction about kalari pai 2 and uh, coming back to the uh, benefits and everything about the kalari pai 2 kalari pai 2 is a complete martial art form because it uh, helps to enforce our mind and the body so it uh, it improves our flexibility strength and it detoxify our body helps to burn excess fat we know that there is many exercises available in our society but kalari pai 2 is uh, our own martial art technique so it uh, improves body flexibility strength it, it uh, detoxifies our body and burn excess fat so uh, it's a, a good uh, living uh, activity and Uh, also kalari pai to develop our respiratory system much more stronger it helps to improve our stamina it control our breath it is one of the best cardio exercise not only a physical ex- exercise kalari pai to is a best cardio exercise uh, if i say about an example we have a small child who has a breathing issues uh, she uh, practiced kalari and uh, done kalari for three four months she got, she got very improvement and her uh, breathing issues got solved so uh, kalari pai is the one of the best cardio exercise and one of the best uh, the, uh, exercise which helps from uh, life this life cell disease we know that nowadays uh, we have uh, patients from sugar cholesterol pressure everything so kalari pai is the one of the finest uh, exercise which helps from life cell disease and uh, next point when we talk about a sustainable life we need a regular training basis kalari pai 2 is not any uh, short term process it is it is not a crash course or uh, something we can learn in a limited period actually kalari pai 2 uh, we we can learn from any age there is no age bar there is no uh, gender uh, discrimination but kalari pai 2 demands daily practice so uh, when when we talk about the uh, drug addicts so kalari pai 2 practice nurse want to practice every day so it keeps our health uh, okay so making part of our daily life the calorie pay to emit body toxins and negative energy calorie pay to empower our pranas we all know about pranas we have different kinds of pranas but we don't know how to empower our prana calorie pay to is the best thing to empower our pranas and uh, as we all know healthy body will help to get healthy mind so we want to uh, keep our body healthy then the, our mind also will be healthy so there will be well if we practice the calorie pay to every day uh, they, the body will keep positive for the entire day so practice calorie every day will make us positive while practicing calorie pay to what we are doing is uh, for a drug addict when we talk about the uh, uh, phase of drug addict we are giving uh, we are accomplishing new task every day so he has to do a new task every day he has to fulfill that task he has to complete that task and uh, so that way he uh, he learn is he learn to uh, complete a task he uh, learn to face challenges in every day basis so it will help to uh, strengthen his mental state and slowly by practicing calorie pay to every day his conscious mind and subconscious mind will uh, slowly start believe that he can do everything he can defeat anything he can uh, accomplish any task he can defeat any threat that's why we are uh, doing here because uh, in here also we have many cases that uh, 
uh, they were drug addicted uh, before then they joined in kalari and they uh, slowly slowly it is not easy to uh, stop the thing very uh, at the say uh, at the first moment it is very hard to uh, stop the drug addict but while uh, while practicing kalari for you in a daily basis it helps to uh, reduce these things because we will get that energy to uh, face everything we can uh, face any threat we can defeat any challenges like that we do the main uh, critical challenge is in here we have to continue this practice that's the main issue here if uh, someone who start calorie pay to or any other form exercise or martial art it's very difficult to start in the beginning because there will be body pain and very uh, <laughs> tender stress and everything will be there in the uh, initial level body will not allow us to do uh, uh, perform well but continuing this uh, practice will help to uh, improve our stamina so thereby we will believe that we can do this thing and while uh, doing a no task every day we believe that okay we have to do we can do many things in our life not we don't want to do uh, to go to negative uh, things we can use here this is a, uh, the uh, most dangerous thing we can see in the youth is they are getting uh, immense energy and lesser time both comes together is very uh, you know it's very dangerous thing because they have they are getting many uh, lesser time also they have energy the energy they are using is, uh, is for negative things they are using for drugs for uh, parties and everything uh, but if we do calorie pay too we are what we are doing is we are using this energy in a positive uh, things in calorie pay to doing calorie pay too and making our health positive so it will help his body stronger and the mind for um, uh, mind also uh, stronger okay and uh, in our kalari i am from lubaina kalari kochi my father is my gurukul uh, Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, good afternoon, all. Uh, we welcome you all to the second day of Sashak Bharat program, which is being organized under the Nasha Mukh Bharat Abhiyan, run by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. So, this whole program was conceptualized, recognizing the detrimental impact of drug use on the country. keeping which in mind the nmba program was started in 2020 which is today expanded across 372 districts of the country the probability of drug dependency varies based on the socio economic conditions of communities which makes them vulnerable to falling into the trap of drug use it has a detriment differential impact on people who belong to different social identities uh, which therefore makes it extreme
be important for us to look at drug use from a more intersectional lens rather than looking at it in a silo. Uh, so bringing together elements of sustainable living, drug use and gender based violence. This 15 day program of Sashak Bharat has been conceptualized under NMBA to discuss the most pressing issues in the country that are being faced today, especially by the youth and the marginalized communities. This program was commenced on 28th of November 2022 and shall go on till the 9th of December 2022, where we will be hosting uh, uh, a series of events which will include uh, panel discussions, webinars, and competitions for awareness and sensitization purposes. Today, we will be hosting a panel discussion on the theme of ingredients to build a healthy, inclusive, and sustainable nation. The panel discussion has been visualized to bring together Nasha Mukbharat Abhyan, which is being championed nationwide by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment for drug demand reduction, along with the initiative of Mission Life, led by Ministry of Forest, Environment and Climate Change, and Ministry of Rural Development's Nai Chetna campaign against gender-based discrimination, specifically gender-based violence. Hence, through this discussion, we aim to bring together and discuss the intersection of drug use, gender-based violence, and sustainable living alternatives. To discuss these three issues in tandem with each other, we have been graced by the participation of three esteemed panelists, Dr. Prabha Chandra, Dean of Fac uh, Faculty Behavioral Sciences and Senior Professor of Psychiatry, Nimhans Bangalore, Mr. Mujib Rahman, a Culinary Pyre 2 artist and a fencing coach from Kerala, and Ms. K. Saroja, Deputy Director, Department of Social Welfare, Government of Manipur. I will now hand over uh, uh, the mic to Soumya. Soumya to take, to take it forward from here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So before beginning the discussion, we would like to introduce the elements of our panel discussion more closely. So I would request Ms. Ariba to give a short presentation on Nashamukh Bharat Avyan. Hello everyone. Uh, Rehan, can you please put up my presentation? Uh. So, Nashamuk Bharat Abhyan is a campaign by Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment against substance use and to make the country drug free. Uh, so, coming to the extent and pattern of substance use in India, we know that alcohol is the most common psychoactive substance used by Indians with 16 crore users. Uh, 3.1 crore individuals uh, in India use cannabis products and 2.26 uh, there are 2.26 uh, opioid users in the country. Next slide, please. Okay. So, um, as on uh, 15th August 2022, we have 272 dis uh, districts in uh, three. Uh, can you please wait, Rehan? Uh, we have 372 districts uh, in 32 states where Nashamak Bharat Abhyan is being implemented. Next slide, please. Okay, coming to the implementation strategy of the Abhyan, which follows three pronged approach, uh, supply curb by the uh, NCB, National Crime Bureau, outreach, awareness, and demand reduction by Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment on treatment facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, objectives of the Nashamukh 